we uh, were finishing up the uh, book of Galatians. That I think we had uh, finished that in about two studies. And uh, I don't know, I was just thinking, there are two books that are attacked by the... I don't know, I was just thinking, there are two books that are... And uh, I think if anyone had understood Galatians, that they would understand Romans. But I thought it might be good if we would go through Romans this time. It's a little longer book. And I think that we did, some time back, start through Romans and take the first two chapters. Now, the first chapter of Romans, Paul is addressing, in it's a letter, to those at Rome. Not necessarily to Romans, it's just marked that way in the name of the book. But uh, it is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to brethren or saints at Rome. They were not necessarily all Romans, but probably most were. And uh, also, there were uh, some Jewish proselytes there. Now, I might go back and mention this as a little uh, of the history of the early days of the New Testament. Jesus had taught his disciples for three and a half years, and then he was crucified, and he was with his disciples who became apostles 40 days after the resurrection. And then he was taken to heaven, but he told them to wait until they would receive the Holy Spirit, which they did receive 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, and uh, to empower them to go out with a great commission. Now, as apostles, the word apostle means one sent forth, proclaiming a message. And actually, it was a proclaiming of a message, but it was not what today in Protestant religion would be called a soul-saving crusade. Jesus did not come on a soul-saving crusade. Never did he invite people to come forward and give their hearts to him, as Billy Graham does, for example, today, and other Protestant ministers. Never did he try to talk anyone into being converted. In fact, uh, in the book of John, you will read that when he was on the way back up north one time, he was passing through Samaria. And, of course, the Samarians, for some 600 years, had been Babylonians that had been moved in there after Shalmaneser of Assyria had uh, conquered the nation Israel in the northern two-thirds or three-fourths of the land and uh, had moved all the Israelites out of the land and taken them as slaves over to the land of Assyria on the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. And then he moved Babylonians in there. Now, they were people of the Babylonian mystery religion. It's spoken of in Revelation 17 and verse 5, as mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She is a church that has had daughter churches come out of her, and they are called harlots. But it is the old Chaldean mystery or Babylonian mystery, pagan religion, with the name of Christ tacked on, with grace made a key doctrine, but it was grace turned into license, or as the Bible words it, lasciviousness, which is license to disobey. And uh, now, uh, as the apostles started out, it's good to have this little background before we start. As the apostles started out, they met with quite a lot of opposition immediately. And the immediate first opposition came uh, from Jews, and Jews who would not accept Christ as the Messiah. And so the first preaching of the uh, apostles was pretty much their testimony that they were eyewitnesses to the fact of the resurrection of Christ, proving that he was the Messiah. They had spent three and a half years, almost every single day, with him before his crucifixion. And after his death and resurrection, they had spent 40 days with him, 
and therefore they were eyewitnesses of the fact that it was the identical same man that they had been with for three and a half years who was resurrected from the dead, proving his messiahship. Now, the uh, Jewish converts, meantime, and I explained this in a former Bible study that we had here, I think that was while we were going through Galatians, that uh, under the Old Testament, there were four types of law. Israel was made a church and a state. It was a civil state as well as a church, but as a church, God never had given them the Holy Spirit. Only the prophets were given the Holy Spirit. But you see, at the time of Adam and Eve, at the creation of man, when Adam and Eve had rejected God, they rejected him as the revealer of uh, knowledge and the source of basic knowledge. They also rejected him as their God and their Savior spiritually, but they also rejected him as their ruler or governor or the one to rule them so far as even a civil government would be concerned. You see, the angels had inhabited the earth prior to that, and uh, the uh, government of God had been set up, and the throne was set on earth with the archangel Lucifer ruling in the throne to administer the government of God. But he had turned away from it, had uh, rebelled, and rejected the government of God, and so the government of God was not being uh, enforced in any way or administered. Adam had been given an opportunity to qualify to uh, sit on that throne, but he would have to have uh, overcome the former Lucifer, who now is called Satan, in order to do it. He would have to uh, reject uh, the way that Satan had turned to. He would have to accept the government of God and accept God as the supreme ruler over him. Now, that's precisely what Adam did not do. And therefore, when Adam rejected God, God drove him out from the Garden of Eden, lest he go back and take of the tree of life, eat and live forever, or his children and descendants after him. In other words, God closed off the Holy Spirit from mankind, except those few God would choose and that were preordained, uh, predestined to be called to have a part in preparing for the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth, which Lucifer had uh, done away with. We need to have all of that background in mind when we come to understand the New Testament. Now, God had said then to Adam, in effect, you have made the decision for yourself and for your children who will become the population of the whole world. And therefore, I sentence you and the world that will come from you to 6,000 years of being cut off from me and from my Holy Spirit. You have rejected me as a revealer of knowledge, as your ruler in government, and you've rejected my government, and you have rejected me as a spiritual savior. So now, go form your own gods, form your own religions. You go form your own fund of education, of knowledge, because what you took was the knowledge you took to yourself the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. Now, you don't know what is right and what is wrong. I was there to tell you, and you wouldn't listen to me. You would not accept knowledge revealed from your own Creator. And therefore, you go and decide for yourself what to believe and what not to believe. Form your own knowledge, your own education, your own educational system. Form your own governments, human governments, to rule over the nations that will come from you over the earth. Form your own religions and your own gods. 
and form your own type of society. Since you've rejected my way of life, you can't even have my kind of society. Now, what we have had since is that many nations have risen up, all descended from Adam and Eve, and um, they have formed their own gods. They began to worship idols. And, for example, now, I just came back from China, and uh, the most ancient religion that we know of in China was just ancestor worship. They had ancestor worship about the time that in Egypt they had the worship of, I guess they would have called it Isis and Osira, or Isis and Osira. I don't know which way it would have been pronounced. But I think they would give the uh, long E sound to the I. And about that time in China, they had ancestor worship. Then in China, they came to uh, Confucianism and Taoism, which rivaled it. And uh, that must have come about the time that the Greeks and Romans were having their gods like Jupiter and uh, Diana and uh, all of those uh, ancient uh, gods that uh, were nothing but mythology made up in the imagination of men that uh, didn't exist at all in uh, ancient Greece and Rome. And then uh, a little later, out of India, came Buddhism, and that came into China, and uh, then Taoism. And uh, in India, they came then later to uh, the transmigration of souls and the Hindu religion. And the world has had its various religions. But in... The Middle East, after Christ, and during the time Christ was there, the Babylonian mystery religion, which had come up in ancient Chaldea, had been transplanted into the northern part of Palestine by uh, King Shalmaneser of Assyria about 700, over 700 years before Christ. And uh, the Jews called uh, the... Uh, people of northern Palestine, that is, the people from Samaria, uh, called them dogs. They would have nothing to do with them. Now, these nations, I mention this just because I've given you just a slight background of some of the ancient religions way back there, hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ, uh, back to a, a thousand years or more. They knew nothing of God. They knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Now, what were these, when these religions got started? Well, immediately after the flood, a religion was started by one mentioned in the 10th chapter of the uh, book of Genesis, who uh, built Nineveh and other cities, Nimrod. And his uh, mother wife, she seemed to be both a mother and a wife. I don't know how that was all mixed up. You'll get it in the book of two Babylons, the Semiramis. And we see a lot about Semiramis even yet in Egypt, I mean in Cairo, and over in Baghdad, and in Damascus, and cities of that kind that are ancient cities. You still see hotels named after Semiramis. And... Uh, she is the one that started the ancient religions that came first into uh, ancient Egypt and then into the Babylonian mystery religion and other ancient religions. But they knew nothing about God. God had shut them off. It isn't that they had rejected God. God had shut them off. And, uh, however, there was some knowledge of God handed on down. And uh, because... We, we, we do find it, it was a perverted knowledge, and they would gotten it all mixed up. They didn't have it in writing, and anything that is handed down by mouth does get twisted and changed and perverted after sometimes uh, in less than one year, let alone the many, many years that passed by. But now, when we come to Rome, Paul is talking in the first chapter about the Gentiles who thought that by that time, the time of Christ, and after in the first century A.D., they uh, had come to the uh, place 
where the Gentiles felt they had developed a great fund of knowledge. We had the so-called great philosophers in uh, Greece and in Athens. And uh, Paul came to them, and you know, they had this idol marked to the unknown God. And Paul said that uh, the God that you ignorantly worship, I will declare to you. He said, the God that made all of you and made mankind and all of the nations on the earth, and uh, the God that is our creator and our maker. Well, now in the first chapter of Romans, Paul mentions how these intellectuals had known something of God, but they would not regard him as God, but how they had turned and rejected everything good about God and had been turned to licentiousness and uh, the worship of idols and uh, to uh, homosexuality and uh, every filthy-minded thing, and uh, that they had looked down on the Jews because the Jews looked on the law. Now, and I can come back to the time in uh, the Jewish religion, First, there was a division among uh, the kingdom of Israel way back, uh, oh, I think that must have been over a thousand years before Christ, in the days right after David died and after Solomon died, and uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam ascended the throne, and uh, but he told the Israelites that he was going to tax them farther than his father ever thought of doing, and so... The people rejected him as their king and made Jeroboam their king. Now, Judah stayed, however, with Rehoboam, and uh, the uh, tribe of Benjamin stayed with uh, Judah, and that formed the kingdom of Judah. But Israel had now had a new king. The first thing that Jeroboam did was to change the annual festivals in the seventh month to the eighth month because he was afraid that uh, they would go down to uh, Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, there they would decide to go back to King Rehoboam and he would lose the throne he had just gotten hold of. So uh, he changed it to the eighth month. Now, also, he changed the day of worship from the Sabbath, the seventh day, to what you might call the eighth day, you see, the same way, or the next day after the Sabbath, which is really the first day of the week. And that's where the Sunday worship started among Israelites. And uh, uh, that was the sign that God had given Israel by which the world would know that they were Israel because no other nation on earth ever kept the Sabbath. No nation did. Now, the Arab nations observe Friday. The so-called Christian nations observe Sunday. And uh, I don't know, are there any uh, religions that observe a Monday? I, uh, I'm not sure. I think there, there, there might be some religion somewhere. But anyway, the um, Sabbath had been assigned to identify God because in six days God had made this present world and created everything in it, the plant and animal life and man. And uh, on the seventh day, he rested. And so the seventh day is a memorial of the creator and creation, which is the proof, after all, of God. And uh, Israel had lost their Sabbath, and so they lost their identity. Now they got to speaking a different language. They lost their language. They didn't speak Hebrew anymore. They lost their identity. And therefore, everybody thought they were Gentiles. Now, they moved into Western Europe and into Britain and came over here to the United States. But you tell people that we are Israel and they think you're crazy. But we are. We are Israel who our forefathers long, long ago lost the identifying mark or sign. A sign is something that a businessman hangs up outside his place of business. It, it shows uh, what kind of business it is, whether it's drugs or furniture or men's or women's clothing or whatsoever, and maybe it's Jones or Smith or, or whoever. It shows who owns it. it. It identifies. A sign identifies. The Sabbath is the sign between God and man. 
you find that in Exodus 31 between verses 12 and 18. And actually, the first sermon I ever preached in my life was on that very Sabbath covenant found in that passage. So I suppose I will never forget it, I hope. And uh, now then, when Israel was taken captive between 721 and 718 B.C., and the uh, Babylonian mystery religion moved into their places in northern Palestine, it left only Judah. Now, a little over 100 years later, between 604 and 585 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded uh, Judah, conquered them, destroyed totally their temple, the temple that Solomon had built, and, uh, and moved them out of that land. And uh, so the land was more or less idle then for quite a while. But 70 years later, God wanted a colony of Jews, and only those of the kingdom of Judah were ever called Jews. God wanted them to go back and uh, uh, build a second temple to be there when Christ would come, which was still going to be 500 years later. And... Uh, so uh, he stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Syria, uh, uh, Assyria, and uh, that's the way he communicated to Cyrus, not the way he communicated to Moses and the prophets. But uh, Cyrus somehow knew, though, that it was God's will, and he gave a decree to send a colony of Jews back to Jerusalem. Now, there was a little colony established there, now, that's all it was. It grew into a fairly good-sized little colony, but it was not Israel, and it was only a small part of Judah. Now, in the book of Ezra, you will find the tribal names of those people who went back, and every one of them are in the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi. Oh, I forgot to mention that King Jeroboam not only started Israel keeping the Sabbath and observing the feast in the eighth month, but he also exiled the tribe of uh, Levi, which were the priestly tribe, and uh, because they were, had the highest income, they were a very small tribe, but they got 10% from all of the other people. Now, uh, there really were 13 total tribes, so beside them there were 12 other tribes, and many of them, most of them, larger than Levi. So each Levite was getting about three and a half times as much money because he got 10% uh, tithe from the others, about three and a half times as much as the others averaged in Israel who uh, were uh, mostly farmers and agrarians but in whatever way they earned a living. And so uh, Levi became one of the tribes of the kingdom of Judah. Well... The people in that tribe now, after Ezra and Nehemiah were uh, two of the prophets sent down there in, in that group where they built the second temple, Zerubbabel was the governor, and Joshua was the high priest, and uh, they were merely uh, types or forerunners of two men in our day that were to build the spiritual temple to which Christ will come the second time, that is, the church, and uh, apparently also to be the two witnesses that are going to uh, preach before the whole world on television that will be transmitted over all the earth. You know what I mean. Uh, apparently it will be satellite television. Uh, how do I know that? because it says the people uh, all around the earth are going to rejoice when they see them, and they will apparently see their dead bodies lying in the street when they will be killed just three and a half days before the second coming of Christ. Well, anyway, in that colony, which is only a part of Judah and none of Israel, the rabbis later on uh, after Ezra and Nehemiah, took the rituals that I explained while we were going through the book of uh, Galatians, which were the physical law of uh, ceremonies that uh, the Israelites had to do every day because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. 
It was only a temporary substitute, and uh, which, uh, of course, was no longer in force after the reality the Holy Spirit came, just like that law of animal sacrifices was a substitute for the sacrifice of Christ and were not in use after Christ came and after he died. And uh, on the rituals and sacrifices, they built a complete law and... Uh, as I explained, I think, before, uh, Gentile nations had a system, instead of the forgiveness of sins, there was nothing like that except uh, through Christ. And other pagan nations never had anything like that at all. That's why I say that the Babylonian mystery religion adopted the uh, doctrine of grace, but they turned it into license to disobey and did away with the law of God. Now then, I'm coming down to the end of this background. They had enforced these rituals and said that they had to observe these rituals to live. Those ritual laws were only for ancient Israel under the Old Covenant and are replaced entirely by the sacrifice of Christ and by the coming of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church. That's the main difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And... Uh, now, the new covenant is an agreement that has not yet been made. But it is being proclaimed, and we are to live under its conditions now, or we will not make it. Now then, a little later on, this Simon Magus that we find revealed in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts got the Babylonian mystery religion going. That religion didn't want any law whatsoever. Now, get this. The first opposition against the apostles was that they didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah, and they, they wanted to enforce the ritual law. In other words, they wanted more law. Instead of just the spiritual law, they wanted to put the physical laws in, too. A little later, the whole thing changed, and the Gentile religion was the opposition, and that was a religion against the law, the spiritual law, the commandments of God. They did away with the Holy Spirit. They called the Holy Spirit a third person, an actual being, a person, and not uh, just a spirit. And, uh, of course, that doctrine was never finally uh, given universal approval throughout all the uh, universal Catholic religion until 321, the time of Constantine. But nevertheless, it was promulgated and taught even before that, the Trinity doctrine, that God is a Trinity, Father, Son, and they called it, that's why they used the term Holy Ghost in the King James Bible. Because in 1611, in England, when the Bible was translated into English, they still believed that the Holy Spirit was a person, so they used the word Holy Ghost. And a child refused to use that term. I always say Holy Spirit. Because ghost is not a right translation from the uh, original Greek word. It should be spirit. And the spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost. It was poured out. It filled people. Now, a person isn't poured out. How is a person taken apart and poured out like water? Now, that's the thing that I, I'm still working on and writing in the book I'm trying to write on a voice cries out. Well, anyway, now, Paul is talking of how the Gentiles had tried to do away with law altogether in the first chapter and uh, how they had turned to wrong ideas and how they had uh, knowledge and had not retained God in their knowledge. And they had an educational system, and he corrects them on that. The second chapter, Paul goes after the Jews, who, uh, now the Gentiles thought they were so much better than the Jews because they said the Jews just had this whole crazy uh, Judaism religion, whereas the Gentiles had knowledge. They had gotten their own kind of human knowledge, but it was not the knowledge of God. And uh, in the second chapter, Paul corrects the Jews, because they boasted that they had the law, but they themselves didn't obey the law. They were not obeying it. Now, we went through that, so I think that we'll just skip that and go right on to uh, 
chapter 3 now, if you will. Now that we have that background, I think we can go right to it. Uh, Paul says, what advantage then has the Jew? He was talking about the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The Gentiles had philosophy. They had all this wanted knowledge that was all human knowledge and uh, filled with uh, myth and uh, with superstition. But the Jews had the law. Now he's comparing the Jew and the Gentile. And he says, what advantage then has the Jew or, or what profit is there of circumcision? Now, here these early Jews believed in circumcision. You see, circumcision is one of those things that Paul had explained was part of the ritual law and uh, that as a religious uh, ordinance, circumcision was done away. However, he didn't say that if you are circumcised just for reasons of good health and so on, it is good and should be done, or God wouldn't have had it done in the first place. But it is not a religious rite anymore, and hasn't been since Christ. He says, what is the advantage then of the Jew? Much every way, chiefly because that under them were um, commanded the oracles of God, that is, the commandments and covenants of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Now, uh, what Paul had in mind there was something like this. In my book, The uh, uh, Human Potential, I come in the last chapter, I believe it's the last chapter, where a lot of people say, well, I've seen people with uh, professed Christianity and they're supposed to be Christians, and uh, if, if the way they live and the things they do are Christian, I don't want any of it. In other words, they judge Christianity by the lives of the people who profess to live it, but are not really living it properly at all. That's what he's talking about here. If people do wrong, and if, what if some uh, do not believe God? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Now notice there it is faith of God, not faith in God. The faith of God is the faith that God himself has, God's own faith. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, now he quotes the Old Testament, that uh, thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and uh, mightest overcome when thou art judged. Now, I don't have the marginal references, but if you do, you'll probably find that it shows where it's quoted from the Old Testament. But if our unrighteousness, that is the Jewish unrighteousness he's talking about now, commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God uh, forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if, uh, see, God is going to judge the world, but God is going to judge it through and by Christ because he's turned all judgment over to Christ. But if our unrighteousness commend to the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For if the truth of God hath more abounded to my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also a judge as a sinner? And uh, not rather, as we be uh, slanderously reported, and uh, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Let us do evil that good may come. Now, he's referring there to a type of uh, religion that uh, some had, and some even who profess Christianity. They said that since we do evil, and uh, uh, God has grace, and through God's grace he can forgive it, that uh, that shows the greatness of God in forgiving our sin. Therefore, the more we sin, the, the greater we make God. 
and it makes God greater because then he has more to forgive, and that makes him greater because he's able to forgive more, so let us sin more. Now, actually, in the early years of Christianity, there was that kind of relation of the Nicolaitans. He's spoken of in Revelation 2. Let us do evil that good may come, uh, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we uh, better than they, that is, we Jews? You've got to get the we and they, and the us and, uh, and, and so on, who he's talking about, all the way through Paul's writings. Are we, that is, we Jews, better than they, the Gentiles? No, in no way. For uh, uh, we have before proved, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, that uh, they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They were not seeking God, and it's a good thing. He says there, I've got that underscored. No one is seeking after God. The apostles didn't seek after Christ. Christ called them. Peter and Andrew didn't want to find Christ. They wanted to be fishermen. And they were out there in the lake fishing. Or in the Sea of Galilee, which is really just a big lake. And, uh, and, and Christ called them. And uh, you see, Jesus said, No man can come to Christ except the Father draw them. And the Father predestinates and calls those that he is predestinated to be called. Now, I do not think that that means that God knew thousands of years before we were born that, is, that I, by the name of Herbert W. Armstrong, would be born in the year of 1892, and that uh, he would call me, and he knew that 10 billion years before even Adam was created. But what I do think is that God has predestinated or foreplanned uh, that a certain few would be called to certain positions when we get to this place, and the, the predestination has nothing to do with whether you'll be saved or lost at all. It only has to do with whether you were called at this time or whether you are not. But no man is seeking God. It's God who seeks us. God is the one who goes fishing and gets us, and we're the fish. They are gone out of the way, they are together become uh, unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their threat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of uh, asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are uh, swift uh, to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. The way of peace the world doesn't know at all. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says is says to them that are under the law, that uh, every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may uh, become guilty before God. Now, under the law, in this case, I think he's referring to the spiritual law, the Ten Commandments. And uh, you are under the law when you have broken the law. And the law, then, is over you and demanding your life as, as its penalty. It is your, your Lord and Master, and it demands your life. And that life is going to have to be paid. But Jesus has ransomed us and paid it in our stead. Under the law doesn't mean under uh, obligation to obey the law. Everybody's under obligation to obey the spiritual law anyway. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, that should be a mark right there. I... Uh, I think in almost every Bible I've used in the last uh, 50 years, you'll find that is marked. By the law is the knowledge of sin. 
let me just explain it this way. No man is justified by uh, a ritual. They believe that uh, a man atoned for his sins by punishing himself. And that was the Gentile religion. Now, the Jews took the uh, physical rituals, which included circumcision and all these uh, physical fleshly laws, and because they considered it irksome and hard to have to do and keep bothering to do it every day, they said that uh, it was a type of punishment, and therefore they were using it to forgive their bad sins by uh, inflicting this punishment on themselves. But on the other hand, now, by the law is the knowledge of sin. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to tell us what sin is. Later, Paul will say, I had not known what sin was except by the law. Because he wouldn't have known it was wrong to covet if the law had not said that. Now, I've got a man that uh, is uh, a very often praying man. In fact, so much so that he is actually self-righteous, and uh, self-righteousness is one of the sins, instead of being so righteous and so good, as some people seem to think. I think he's talking about the Ten Commandments here, because he said, uh, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law. He's not talking about Jews that were under obligation to obey the rituals. But he's talking to those that have sinned, and therefore they're under the law, and the law's over them, demanding their life. But every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may uh, become guilty before God. So that includes the Gentiles as well as Jews. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In other words, uh, all right, let's uh, assume, and I'd have to get the original Greek to know whether deeds there, and I think it means performance now of uh, the spiritual law, or else it means by the uh, uh, physical uh, ritual law, but I don't think so. I think that in this case, deeds is translated from a word that means performance or obedience. And uh, now by your obedience to the law, I obey the law today. I do exactly what the law says. I love my neighbors, I love God more than myself, I love my neighbor as myself, I'm very good. That still is not going to save me, because if I sinned yesterday or day before, that still is there, and the penalty is still over me. And I'm still under the law, and it's over me, because I have broken it. Say, everyone has broken the law. And that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God, because all have sinned. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law tells us what sin is. We wouldn't know that it is wrong to covet if the law didn't say thou shalt not covet. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being a witness by the law and the prophets, which means by the Old Testament scriptures. Even the righteousness of uh, God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, not our faith in Christ, but it is the faith of Christ which will be given to us through the Holy Spirit. It's the faith that Christ gives us, and that is the faith Christ has. Even the righteousness of God, which is by uh, faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And of course, that is a, a verse that uh, millions of so-called Christians quote. Being justified freely by his grace, not by our performance of obeying today. We have to do that anyhow through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, uh, that is, that uh, his blood was his life and that it paid our price for us, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past 
through the forbearance of God. Now, I'm glad it says that, the remission of sins that are past. Grace does not forgive a sin that maybe you have not yet committed so that you have a license to go ahead and do it and it's already been forgiven in advance. Grace does not forgive any sin in advance so that it gives you permission to go and do it. It only forgives sins up to that minute. And I have written that and other people come back at me and, oh, boy, do they get angry at that when I say that. A lot of them, uh, they say that uh, once you're in grace, you're just always in grace. And and, and that you can't sin anymore after that. And that uh, in other words, you go ahead and sin, but God doesn't call it sin anymore. You've been forgiven before you start. That's like we, uh, we left uh, Tokyo about 6 o'clock Sunday evening. But we arrived here about, what was it, about 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock Sunday, the same afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And we didn't leave uh, Tokyo until 6 o'clock that same evening. Of course, we passed an international date line on the way, and that's the answer. But we arrived before we started. The remission of sins are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? You see, the Jews were boasting because they had the law, and the Gentiles were boasting because they had such great knowledge, they thought. He says, it is excluded. By what law? Of works? Now, in other words, the ritual law? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, you have to understand what justified means. Justified means your guilty past is, is cleaned up and paid for. Justified is a, a matter referring to your past sins. And uh, you're not justified by your righteousness today. You're justified by the blood of Christ. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? of works or rituals, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So that is, apart from. It doesn't mean without. It doesn't mean you can go on and not, not have to have the good works of performing God's uh, spiritual law. But, uh, and I think it's talking about the spiritual law there. Uh, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Because our keeping the law today doesn't forgive us for the sins we committed yesterday and last year. Does that do away with the law, so we don't need to keep it? God forbid, he says. Yea, we establish the law. Even that faith establishes it, but if you break it, you yeah. still have to keep it today. And uh, if you didn't keep it yesterday, it takes the blood of Christ to erase it. And your performance today won't do it, nor the rituals will, won't do it. What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, now it's talking there about not works of the law, but by good works, by good performance and obedience. He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For uh, what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Well, he believed and he also obeyed. But Abraham disobeyed on certain occasions, too. But he did have faith. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not to reckon of grace, but as a, a debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that uh, justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man 
unto whom God uh, imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision, before he was circumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the, the faith, which he, he had had yet being uncircumcised, that uh, he might be the father of all of them that believe, though uh, uh, they uh, be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see, it isn't just that you believe and then go out and sin and do not obey. It is that what he's trying to get at here is that we cannot obey God's law, and live the perfect life in our own strength alone. It takes the faith to trust God to help us through the Holy Spirit. Now, later you will find in uh, Galatians and also back in James how Abraham was not justified by faith alone, but also by works. His performance, his belief uh, resulted in obedience. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had uh, being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed, meaning Christ, through the law, but uh, through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the uh, law be heirs, faith is made void, and uh, the promise is made of none effect. Because the law works wrath. Because when you break it, the penalty is death, and that's the wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Now, I've used that as an argument of people trying to argue about the fact that we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments if they're done away. Where no law is, there is no transgression. So notice that and uh, combine that with what we're going to see when we come to the fifth chapter. I use that in proving that the law didn't just start when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. The law started with Adam. I'll come back to that later when we get to the fifth chapter. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace, that is, uh, which is an undeserved pardon or free gift, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham is the father of the uh, so-called uh, faithful. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth the things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to uh, that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. That is quoting what God said to Abraham. And being not weak in faith, he considered uh, not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet uh, the deadness of Sarah's womb, who was sterile and could not have a child. But God performed a miracle, so she did have a child in her old age. I think she was what? Was she 90 or was it 98 when Isaac was born? And Abraham married again when he was about 146 years old and uh, had six sons, and it doesn't name the daughters. I would assume there must have been uh, as many daughters. 
He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he also was able to perform. Now, there is a definition of faith, that God will perform what he has promised, and you don't, all you have to do is just, you know, he will do it. And it doesn't depend on what you see, how you feel, anything about it. It's just if God has promised it, and he tells you what the conditions are, and you perform those conditions, it's got to happen. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe in him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and uh, was raised again for our justification. Sometimes I think I would almost like to just rewrite this whole book of Romans and put it in language that everyone would understand. But I would have to put it in my own language. I couldn't just make a transliteration and, and still make it plain. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and uh, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And uh, not only us, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's another sentence right there that I have underscored. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, love is the fulfilling of the law. But the love we have, the love with which we were born, the love that we have developed in our life, will not fulfill the spiritual law of God. It takes a spiritual love to fulfill that spiritual law, and we were not born with it, and we cannot develop it. So it takes the love of God, which he gives us. Now, so few people understand what is the two things I've been showing here. God not only gives us his love, the Holy Spirit is the love of God. That's what it imputes to us and puts within us the very love of God, a love we never had before. That's a new kind of love that comes into us. Also, it's a new kind of faith which we never had. People say, well, I just can't seem to work up faith. Well, the faith we need is not something we work up. The faith we need is what God gives us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit puts that faith in us. We don't work it up. And how does the Holy Spirit put it in us? Well, it, it, it's the faith of Christ. It's the same faith that Christ used to walk on the water that he used to raise the dead and heal the sick. It's the same love that God has, the love God has for all of those that he has created. And I don't think that most people in the church really get that, that we are to have a divine love, a divine faith that was not born in us and that we cannot produce or work up, that it's something that God will give us. And that's by grace, an unmerited gift. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. See, that love, come by the Holy Spirit, but it is given to us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Uh, the average human isn't going to just die for some righteous man. Yet peradventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and gave his life for us. Before we ever even became righteous, and while we were, were terrible sinners, that, that we might become righteous. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be delivered from wrath through him. And that really is the wrath of Satan. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, 
Now, reconciled to God by the death of his son. You see, there's so much right there. The Protestant religion leaves God the Father out of it altogether. They only have Christ. Billy Graham just says, come and give your heart to Christ. Give yourself to Christ. That's all there is to it. Look, if we're going to sit on that throne with Christ, or to sit in that throne, as the Bible has it, Jesus could not sit there until he overcame Satan. Jesus had to conquer Satan, and where Satan had disobeyed and rebelled against God, Jesus had to uh, obey God. Well, if we're going to sit with him in that throne, we have to do the same thing. Absolutely. And God is the lawgiver. Now, when we sin, that is against God, not against Christ. And we have to first be made right with God. God is the one who has eternal life to give. And Jesus merely reconciles us to God so God can give it to us. But we can't be reconciled to God as long as we are under condemnation for having disobeyed God. We've got to get that past disobedience against God's law. God is the lawgiver, the Father, I mean. And we've got to get right with God the Father first. And the Protestants leave that out. In other words, they leave repentance out. We have got to completely repent. Now, Christ makes grace possible. And so it's Christ, then. What does he have to do with it? First, he is the one who makes it possible to reconcile us to God. But you've got to get reconciled to God first before Christ can save you. Now, get this time order right here. This is very important. For if when we were, I said when we came to the fifth chapter, and here it is, if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, Christ's death reconciles us to the Father, and you've got to get reconciled to the Father before the Son can save you. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved. But how? By Christ's death? Does Christ's crucifixion, does his death on the cross save you? What does it say there? We shall be saved by what? By his life, L-I-F-E. And that is what Billy Graham doesn't understand. Let's go back just a little here. God commandeth, back to verse uh, 8, God commandeth his love toward us, now, God is the great love giver and the lover in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gave Christ. Now, that is what the Father did. He gave Christ to die for us. Then what did Christ do? Well, Christ gave his life then for us. So they, they both had a part in it, didn't they? The Father gave Christ and Christ gave his life. Much more than being now justified by Christ's blood that's What does justified mean? Are your guilty past wiped out. That penalty that the law has over you, and you're being under the law, you're no longer under the law. It no longer has a claim on your life. You're now straight with God the Father, who is the giver of the law. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. You've got to get that reconciliation with the Father first before the Son can help you, but the Son has to have his part in even doing that. We shall be saved by his life, by his resurrection. By Christ's resurrection, we will have a resurrection. And it's appointed to all to die, one way or another. And... Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement at one meant, and made at one with God. We've got to be made at one with God the Father as well as with Christ the Son. And so many forget that. And they say, oh, well, you're the God the Father, that's just Old Testament stuff. And you know, the God of the Old Testament was not God the Father. My Aunt Wilda Armstrong 
wife of my father's younger brother, her youngest brother. She joined the uh, Presbyterian Church because that was where the wealthy women belonged, and she wanted to hobnob along with them in the social clubs. And uh, all she knew about the Bible was what little she got there. And she says, well, Herbert, she says, I tell you, she was disgusted that I was taking up with religion in any form whatsoever. She said, uh, Jesus Christ of the New Testament I, I can put up with. But that God of the Old Testament, I can't stand that God, that harsh, stern, cruel God of the Old Testament. Now, was she lost? Is she gone to hell? No. She died. She's dead. And she won't know anything for over a thousand years from now. And then she will come up, and maybe I will be able to explain some of this to her. But her mind and heart was solely on her social clubs and things of that kind. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Now, what did I say a while ago when I told you I'd get back to it when we got to the fifth chapter? Where no law is, there is no transgression. Did the law exist before Moses? If there is not a law, there is no transgression. Now, look here. Wherefore, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam sinned, and if there was no transgression, why, why did Adam sin? Why did he die then? He died because he broke the law. Sin is the transgression of the law, and death is the penalty of sin. And God pronounced the death penalty on Adam if he disobeyed. Now, he could not have done that unless he explained the law that he would be disobeying. And it isn't recorded because, you see, God doesn't give us a full account of so many words in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. There are over 2,000 years covered there in just those 11 chapters, and uh, it's so very brief, it's only a small summary. But... Uh, Sin was imputed, and it is not imputed when there is no law, but sin was imputed because all of sin, even beginning with Adam. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. For well, therefore, again, sin would not have been imputed if there had not been a law. There was the law, and that was the law that was before the ritual law. Now, later he's going to say the ritual law was added because there had been transgressions of the spiritual law. And it was added to try to help them to live without continuing to break the spiritual law. This is all so plain and simple when we understand it. For until the law, sin was in the world. That's from Adam uh, up until Moses. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. So there was a law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses. The penalty of the law was being enforced. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the uh, figure of him that was to come. In other words, he was a type of Christ, except that he, he went the evil way and Christ the right way. But not as the offense, so uh, also as the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by the man Jesus Christ, uh, hath abounded unto many. And uh, not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was to uh, condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses under justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of the grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, who is Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so 
by the righteousness of one, the free gift uh, came upon all men under justification. That It doesn't mean that it did come at that time, because the world has not been judged as yet. It's just not judged, but it is going to be. And it means that it came that it would be on all men. First, the uh, condemnation because of the transgression of the law, but second, the grace by uh, the sacrifice of Christ. But it hasn't applied as yet to everybody. But his part of it has been done. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, the second Adam, Christ, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, now that was in the days of Moses, that the offense might abound. But you see, they didn't realize what, the, what sin was until God spelled it out by codifying the Ten Commandments. But the law had uh, actually existed, whether it had been spelled out to them in so many words or not. That as sin has reigned under death, even so might grace reign through righteousness under everlasting life by Jesus Christ our Lord. He goes on, shall we, what do we say then, oh, sin, shall we uh, all sin that grace may abound? Now, as I said, the Nicolaitans had that doctrine that the more we sin, the greater we make God out, because that makes him so much greater because he can forgive all those sins, which is a lot of ridiculousness. Well, that brings us up to chapter 6. That's four chapters I've gone through besides summarizing the first two, so I think uh, that's some of the writings of Paul which Peter said Paul writes in a way that's hard to be understood, and many do rest what he wrote to their own destruction, because they just don't understand it. And they get mixed up. You've got to know a little about... You see, at the time he wrote that, way back in the first century, it was the people of Israel were long since gone. They weren't around there, and it was only uh, many of the Jews, and they understood all of this and about the different laws. But many people today don't, and that's why you do need the background of what's in the Old Testament and the things that they did know in Judea in those days to really understand the things that Paul has written. I guess a lot of people think Paul contradicted himself, but he didn't. 